Good morning. Good morning. Okay. Um, we'd like to welcome Anita of Stone Street. She's here with us again today. Who will be our pianist um, this Sunday. And as always, her presence um, at the piano is always a blessing. As we listen to the prelude, take this time to prepare your heart for the word that God has for you today. Put aside your cares and your concerns and focus on the message that the Spirit wants to reveal to you. Does everyone see what this is? <laughs> Most of us, we haven't used this thing in years because we always have the, the words up on the screen. Um, so today is going to be a little different. You're going to get to use this hymn book and turn to page 343, Amazing Grace, and stand if you're able and um, join me in singing um, Praise to God through Amazing Grace, all verses.
Amen. You know, I've been singing, I've been singing that song 60 years, I guess. For some reason, in, in singing it today, Those words just came alive. Praise God. As we enter a time of confession, ask the Spirit to reveal to you any sins you may have committed so that you may repent and thank God that He has forgiven you. Please join me in a time of silent prayer. Father, we praise you. You are the most high God, the creator of the universe, and without you, nothing exists. You are love. And you loved us so much that you sent your son to die on a cross for our sins. We've been freed from the power of sin and death. Yet we still choose at times to stray from what we know is right and give in to temptation. Thank you for loving us so much that you have forgiven us of those sins and desire to remove all the condemnation that the enemy tries to put on us. Help us to keep our eyes on you and you alone. Help us to believe your word and put our faith in you instead of listening to the voice of the evil one and his lies. You are great and greatly to be praised. Thank you for your faithfulness. We love you. Amen. Amen. First John 1 John 1.7 says, If we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Your sins have been forgiven. Praise God.
Come on down. I don't need a mic. <laughs> How are you all doing? How pretty and tall we look. Got a story. It's a good story. I really like it. I got two other good ones. It was a toss up which one to do. But you want to know what the name of this book is? Oh, wait. You all can't see it if I don't elevate. I'll give you an extra foot. <laughs> The name of this book is What If Everybody Said That? Kind of like the powers out of the church. What if everybody said, we're not going? It'd be empty in here, wouldn't it? So here's our story. I'm going to do the Sharon Herndon speed reading class again. So it's really good. I think you're going to learn something. At the park, some kids asked if they could play. And you know what I said? No boys allowed. Huh. Their mom yelled at me, what if everybody said that? No big kids, no freckles allowed, no climbing for girls. That's just me. Hmm. I went to art class and we were drawing dogs. And I said, those don't look like dogs. But the art teacher said, what if everybody said that? And look what they thought. It's garbage. I really am a bad artist. I'll never draw again. At the beach, I wanted to scare my cousin, so I said, look, there's a shark. What happened? Everybody asked, shark? Swimming, no, swimming polar bears, peanut butter and jellyfish, monster hermit crabs, the undertoads. What if everybody said that? Look, she's laughing. During sharing at school, I had new shoes. I wanted to go first. What if everybody said that? This is my turtle. I'm an elf. No, me, me, me. Oh, you couldn't get to see anything, could you? Here. When a boy in my class had glasses, I said, you sure look funny. What if everybody said that? Here's how people can be mean. This little girl has braces, and they're like, oh, did you see that girl? Those braces. Metal mouth. What if everybody said that? When some little girl forgot her lunch on the field trip, the guy said, maybe we could share our lunch. No way, I'm going to eat all mine. What if everybody said? And then when we had a substitute, he was in the hospital, they asked us to make cards, and you know what I said? Mm, not right now, I'm kind of busy. What if everybody said that? Look how lonely. On the soccer team, our team was losing, and I said, this game's done. I quit. What if everybody said that? And then there was a new little girl in my room. <coughs> and I said, I've got plenty of friends, and I didn't invite her to play. My mom heard and gave me a disappointed look. What if everybody said that? The next day, I went to the girl's house and I said, I'm sorry, let's be friends. Welcome to the neighborhood. We could go bike riding in the park. Oh, your cat is so pretty. Do you want to play with me? What if everybody said that? Everybody should. Because you know what? When we say stuff, we sometimes think we're funny. But you know what? Sometimes it hurts people's feelings. And our words have a lot of power. So let's say a prayer, okay? Heavenly Father, help us to say the right things. Help us to speak through you in our hearts so that we say nice things and we make other people feel your love and not feel like we're better than them or that we want to exclude them. Help us to love everybody and to treat everybody the way you would want us to. Amen. Let's rock and roll.
Good morning, church. This is your one chance to get closer. I'll try to speak up. What? All right, we come to God's Word. We continue our series on the book of Acts. We have two passages this morning. We'll be reading from Acts 15 and Acts 16. Acts 15, verses 36 through 40, and 16, verses 22 through 34. So let's prepare our hearts to hear God's Word. Some time later, Paul said to Barnabas, Let's go back and visit the believers in all the towns where we preach the word of the Lord and see how they are doing. Barnabas wanted to take John, also called Mark, with them, but Paul did not think it was wise to take him because he had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not continued with them in their work. They had such a sharp disagreement that they parted company. Barnabas took Mark and sailed to Cyprus, but Paul chose Silas and left, commended by the believers to the grace of the Lord. The crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas, and the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten with rods. After they had been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison, and the jailer was, com was commanded to guard them carefully. When he received these orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once, all the prison doors flew open and every chain came loose. The jailer woke up, and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But pa Paul shouted, Don't harm yourself. We're all here. The jailer call, uh, called for lights, rushed in, and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and all the others in his house. At that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. Then immediately he and his household were baptized. The jailer brought them into his house and set a meal before them. He was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God. He and his whole household. The word of the Lord. Would you please pray with me? Lord, we don't need the lights, the sound, the screen to be powered. But we do need your spirit to empower us. Lord, we don't need the illumination that is typically in this sanctuary, but we do need the illumination of your spirit in your word. Lord, we pray, open our hearts, our minds to receive and to respond to your glory and your kingdom. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So to open, I want to share a story from Louis Giglio. Some of you probably have heard of Pastor Louis Giglio. He says that the church is built primarily by blocking and tackling. And you're like, what does that mean? Well, you know, during those football games 
where there's a, the team is behind, but just by a little, and it's near the end, and the quarterback throws that Hail Mary pass all the way across the field into a quagmire of players just hoping that it'll get to the right player, receive that ball, and they win the game, get into the, the end zone and win. You know, we love those kinds of games. We get excited about those plays, too. But the experts, the ones who really know the game, they tell us the games are won in the trenches, meaning that the work that's done by the offensive line, the defensive lineman, that usually determines who will win the game. That's where it happens. So Louis, he was told this when he was planning this huge evangelistic event in a basketball center in an effort to plant a church. And he asked one of his church growth friends for some advice. And his friend said, Louis, what you're doing here in this arena, it is going to be amazing. It's going to be important. But you need to know that those are the touchdown bombs. But that's not the church. You need to know that from day one. Church is about blocking and tackling. And Louis never forgot that. And really, it's what we see here in the book of Acts. Yes, we see those breakthrough miracle moments, but they're surrounded by a thousand other smaller, let's call them micro-miracle moments. When the Spirit is definitely up to something, but we don't always see all of it with our eyes. He's up to something in the trenches where God has called us. So in these middle chapters of Acts, uh, you know, they're, they're often passed over. They're not as familiar to some people. Uh, but this is where we begin to see the work in the trenches. We see that in the life of faith, in our life of faith, when we work together as Christ calls us to in His mission, we're going to face opposition. You know, that's not just because of different people who have different personalities and different opinions. You know, we may have done this differently this morning, or I don't know why this was had to do. We get all those kinds of things. We may think about it. But it's also much more significantly the enemy wanting to stop us from spreading the story of the resurrection. That's what we need to be more concerned about. Stopping us from the impact of the resurrection on all of creation. And one of the ways that he has done this for thousands of years since the very beginning is by bringing division into the church. We see that happen a little bit in our passage. Now, I believe, and I've said it many times over to many people, that we're blessed here at Riverlawn to have a sense of unity and fellowship, which should be the norm, but sometimes is not. And I'm incredibly thankful for that. I give thanks to that for that quite often. But then we should also ask, what about that sense of unity and fellowship with believers of other congregations, other churches in the area? Because even in healthy churches, you know, strong relationships, even with that, tensions can still break out. We still fall short. Pride still gets in the way. You know what, this was not foreign to the early church. We sometimes think, well, the golden age of the church back in the book of Acts. But you look at chapters 15 and 16, you realize, no, nope, even from the beginning, there was opposition, there was division. In chapter 15, you see that in the, the Jerusalem council, which many may look at and see, well, that's just a bunch of church politics. But it's actually a crucial moment in the early church because as they struggle over what to require Gentile Christians to do, and there's no small amount of disagreement, in the end they actually do allow the Holy Spirit to work. To work through their conflict, to move toward gospel-based inclusion of the Gentiles. You see them dealing with legalism, but thankfully moving away from legalism. It's not perfect, but given their context, given their racial history, the conflict is handled well because of the Holy Spirit, because they allow it to be guided by the Spirit. So sometimes conflict can actually be that matrix, that, matrix, that catalyst that the Spirit can use. Have we considered that? But and you probably knew a but was coming. We also see division happen uh, here with Paul at the start of his second missionary journey. Barnabas wants to take 
John Mark along. Mark, who would later write the Gospel of Mark. But Paul says, no way. Nope. Not going to happen. Why? Well, if you remember on the first missionary journey back in Acts 13, they didn't get very far before Mark bowed out. The pressure got too hot for him, and he just says, you know, this is too much for me. I'm out. And Paul says, like, really? You're just going to drop out when we're in the middle of the mission? And so when the time comes for the next journey and Barnabas wants to bring John Mark along with them, Paul says, no. Nope, we're not going to have any quitters on this team. It's too important. Absolutely not. And so really we, we see what's almost like the first church split. Not really, but you see this sense of divisiveness. Barnabas takes Mark to spread the faith in one direction. Paul takes a new partner named Silas in his missionary journey. And what's wonderful is that God uses all of that. It's all part of his sovereign plan. Despite our limitations, our pride, our brokenness, our divisions. So, you know, I'm, I'm going to get to some of those blocking and tackling moments that they did in just a minute. But first, I want to show you something wonderful that we find here in this scripture. Because we can look at that passage about Paul saying, nope, no second chances. And we say, wait a minute, where's all this grace that you proclaimed in the letters? Oh, and we may think that's a horrible ending. And yet... While Paul and Barnabas split up several years later, really when Paul is nearing the end of his life, he's writing to Timothy in probably the last letter he wrote before his death. And he says, bring John Mark because he's useful to me. It's short and sweet, but there's so much in that statement. Somehow, by the power of the Spirit, this is an act of the Spirit. Make no mistake that the relationship had been repaired. Reconciliation. Reconciliation is at the heart of the gospel. It is what God is all about. It's why He sent Jesus to us in the first place, to repair that relationship. And it's what we've been given to extend. That was the whole point of those missionary journeys. Multiple times it says that we've been given the message of reconciliation to be ambassadors of. So at some point Paul got it when it came to, to John Mark. And recognized what God has done and is doing. You know, and sometimes to do that well, we have to start small. You know, we, we, we often don't see small as a good thing. I think it's Joshua Harris. We had that, that praise song with the kids, Dream Small. This was always a, a favorite. And it's a powerful one, too. If you haven't heard it, you should look it up, Dream Small. Uh, but we need to see the significance of that. Maybe there's someone that you've had some hostility or division with. Maybe you can go to them and say, you know, you know that relationship bump in the road we had, that pothole that we fell into. Yeah, I want to own up to my part in that so we can fix it. Can you, in the power of the Holy Spirit, be a man or woman of peace to act in such a supernatural way, trusting in Him? To go back and say, I want to admit that some of that was me. And like Barnabas with his encouragement, like Paul with his repentant heart, I want to be a person of peace and to restore this relationship for the sake of Christ and the gospel. And for nothing else, more than anything else, for Christ and for his gospel. See, the, the church isn't built on personalities. No. It's built on the power of God in the preaching of the gospel and the blocking and tackling of love and sacrifice. That's what the church is built on. So let's not get distracted by thinking against something else. And that leads me to the scenario that I, I hinted at a bit ago with Paul and Silas. They've recently, if you kind of want to know the context of our passage, they recently helped a slave girl by freeing her of an evil spirit in the middle of Acts 16. Now, you would think that the people would be happy about this, right? Nope. Uh, her owner, the owner of this slave, had been using her condition to make money. You know, to, to be kind of a fortune teller, so to speak. And now he sees this as a hit to his business. He sees the negative economic impact. And so he stirs up the people to get Paul and Silas wrongfully arrested, then beaten, and then thrown into jail 
in Philippi. And now we come to this midnight moment. It's a beautiful moment. I think we should savor this passage, this midnight moment. Now think about it. They're tired, they're injured, they're in pain, they're probably, I would be angered, this is unjust. And they're placed in stocks, and it's midnight, it's dark. It was interesting this morning as I came in to the gym and the sanctuary, I'm like, hey, this is very fitting. We got kind of a prison, you know, we're down in the dungeon at midnight kind of thing. Works out pretty good. But you know what? What do they do? What do you think you would do in that moment, tired, injured, treated unjustly, imprisoned? You know, you would think you'd be upset, you'd be despairing. And without this account of the Holy Spirit, I don't think any of us would have guessed what happens. But it says in 1625 that around midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing. Singing hymns of praise to God. Hymns of praise. You know, I'm sure you're thinking, oh yeah, yeah, well that's exactly what I would have done when I'm, when I'm mistreated and I'm shut down. That's exactly where I go. I always want the opportunity to stop and sing a great song of praise. Eh, typically we're not that way. Normally that's not our plan. That's not normally our MO when it comes to being um, hurt and when we hit bottom. We usually worship God on those bright sunny days on the mountain top. That seems natural. But here's Paul and Silas. What they're doing is supernatural. It's supernatural. Now there was a precedent for the Jews to sing in those kinds of situations, but they were songs of lamentation. Very different. Psalms, lamentation, woe, sorrow. Now that would have been the order of the day, but this is so different. Because of Christ, and because of the gift of the Holy Spirit, they knew that even through their circumstances had changed, even though the circumstances were far from ideal, God had not changed. God had not changed. They knew that God was still the same loving, powerful, miraculous God that they had seen deliver Peter and fall on Cornelius and save Lydia and rescue that slave girl just the day before, that He was still the God of the breakthrough. They knew that. They believed it. And they were going to worship Him no matter what. You know, we think of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, too. No matter what, we're going to worship Him. We're going to serve Him. And here's the phrase that just captures my heart. We can miss it. It doesn't seem all that spectacular, but it captures my heart. It says that all the prisoners were listening. All the prisoners were listening. Can you imagine that there had probably never been a moment quite like that in that jail, either for the guards or for the cellmates, where they had witnessed something like this, that at the midnight hour a worship service breaks out? That's strange. That's not typical. Now, I've heard sermons about how God heard their worship and He was pleased, and so He rewarded them by sending the earthquake and freeing Paul and Silas, but it doesn't say that in the account. It's not in there. It's possible, but it's not in the text. And I believe there's a reason that it's not in the text, because I think that the main act of the Spirit, the main miracle is not the earthquake, it's not the fetters being broken, it's the praising of the hearts of the believers moving the hearts around them. That's what he was doing. That was the miracle of the Spirit. Because, of course, we, we hear about the jailer. We see how it changed his life and his family's life. What happens to him that's bigger than the earthquake. Paul and Silas, they stay in the prison when the doors fly open and the chains came loose. That would seem like a sign to me, right? You would think that, any, that pretty much anyone would be like, this is our chance. But they stay. And that's interesting because if their release was supposed to be the main miracle, why didn't they leave? But they kept worshiping. That was their focus. That was what was most important. And when the jailer comes in and sees, he almost kills himself. Paul tells him, stop. But when he knew that they were free but they were still there, he wanted to know what gives? What's the story? Why? Who are you? 
And they told him about a greater freedom than being freed from stocks and dungeons. He discovered the truth about Jesus. And he and his entire family hear the gospel. They come to faith. They're baptized. Worship changed everything in that prison and in Philippi. Worship did that. You know, earlier this, this year, some of you know, um, my, my niece, my twin brother's daughter, Renee, uh, suffered from congestive heart failure, was hospitalized, and Brian decided to fly down to see her, lives in Jacksonville, Florida. And on the plane, Brian was praying for her, and this passage, this picture of Paul and Silas came to his mind as he was interestingly squished in the window seat of the economy class. I thought it was just me. He's, he's, he's a lot thinner than me. He doesn't have any room to complain. But anyway, um, he's feeling trapped. He felt like he was in a similar place. Obviously, it was not nearly as dire as Paul and Silas. But here, he's thinking of his daughter going back into the hospital. So it was. This is a very serious moment. And so all of this happening, but Brian knew something. He knew that Renee's faith... And he knew God's love for her. So guess what he did? My twin brother, also a preacher. Right there, with someone right next to him, he starts singing, Shout to the Lord. On the airplane. He's probably, you know, I, I gave him credit. I probably wouldn't have thought to do that. But you may know it. It's a beautiful, beautiful classic praise song. We sang it a lot in, in college and seminary. My Jesus, my Savior, Lord, there is none like you. All of my days I want to praise the wonders of your mighty love. My comfort, my shelter, tower of refuge and strength, let every breath, all that I am, never cease to worship you. Shout to the Lord, all the earth, let us sing. Power and majesty, praise to the King. Mountains bow down and the seas will roar at the sound of your name. I sing for joy at the work of your hands. Forever I'll love you, forever I'll stand. Nothing compares to the promise I have in you. It's a beautiful praise song. It's powerful. It resonates. It wasn't very loud, Brian uh, singing that song, and the passenger sitting next to him might have thought that he was crazy. But it didn't matter. It didn't matter one iota. Brian knew that he needed to praise God in that hard moment, and he needed to do out loud. Why? Not to get any kind of attention, so that God's goodness would be known. God's goodness would be known to have nothing to do with his circumstances to trust in his faithfulness and love. And yes, Renee was freed from those bounds of the hospital room with, of course, Brian did pray for, we all prayed for, but his praise was not contingent on that. His prayer wasn't. Another song by Casting Crown says it very well. I will praise you in this storm and I will lift my hands for you are who you are no matter where I am. <clears throat> That's the key here. That's where we see with Paul and Silas. Maybe you're in that midnight moment right now. A bit like Paul and Silas were. Now don't, don't misunderstand me. In those moments there is nothing wrong with praying, God please help me. That is a good thing. Jesus tells us to ask the Father to help us when we're in need. It is part of our faith. It's what He's called us to do. But now, here's the thing. We have the gift of the Spirit, so we can do it in a whole new way, an even greater way. We can pray that prayer and add, I'm going to worship you no matter what. No matter what. Because, yes, the circumstances have changed, but you, God, you have not. You remain the same. Lord, you are still seated on that throne. We can be like Saul. We can be a Paul and Silas. 
And so as we think about that midnight moment, that song of worship, even though a lot happened with that earthquake, it, it didn't immediately change the situation or outcome. They stayed there, but it changed them. It deepened their faith to give them opportunity to proclaim and declare who our God is. So I, I don't know where you are today, but here's the thing. Worship's the right response. No matter where you are today, worship is the right response, no matter what you're facing, because it's what helps you block and tackle. It what helps you block and tackle in all the places of life so that you can see God and see God use it to build His kingdom. Now there will only may be someone watching and listening as you go through it, like those prisoners, like that jailer whose life may just be different forever because of how you responded in that black, uh, block and tackle moment. How your worship becomes faith and action, even in the midst of hardship, especially in the midst of hardship. How are people witnessing your faith, your praise of God? Because more than people praising God for the good things in their life, they're going to take notice of the ones in the trenches. The ones who have been knocked down but still believe in the great, sovereign, good power of our God. So worship God in the trenches. That's the call we've been given. Worship God in the trenches and let Him use your midnight moments in a way that you can't even begin to imagine. Let's pray. Lord, we thank You for what you did in that prison, in that jail with Paul and Silas. For how your spirit worked, how you were proclaimed and glorified and the lives that were forever changed because of it. And may we know and believe that you continue to to work in those ways as we're in the trenches, when we have those midnight moments, that you are at work. So may we be those who offer those hymns of praise, whether it is the song of our lips, the actions of our lives, the ways that we can proclaim who you are, what you've done, who you've made us to be. That you might be glorified, lives might be changed, your kingdom furthered in the gospel given to all the world. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We've heard how God works. We've seen it. We believe it. I pray you believe it. I hope you've witnessed it. I, I, I know that we have those midnight moments. Some of you have already expressed, even this morning, some of the midnight moments that you've recently faced. We know that there are many throughout this country on the East Coast and the, and the states around us that have suffered greatly and are in that midnight. And it feels a lot more than a moment. It's going to take a long time. But the question is, how do we trust God and how do we respond as Paul and Silas responded to that opportunity to proclaim who our God is and what He does? One way we do that is through our giving, through our tithes and our offerings to do the work that the Lord has called us to do. So we invite you to come to give with joy, thanksgiving, faith unto the Lord and His purpose through tithes and offerings.
Please pray with me. Lord, as we witness Paul and Silas offering their praise, their prayers unto you amidst darkness, and amidst uncertainty, we face that in our lives and in the lives around us and those even further. Lord, we pray that we may also in faith and trust Give not only these gifts, but our voices and our lives to that end. That you might be glorified. That we might be able to trust you, even in the trenches, knowing that you are accomplishing what only you can do. And so we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Well, let's pray. Lord, we come before you. We give you the praise. We thank you that just like Paul and Silas, we can pray to you. We can sing hymns of praise to you. Lord, we thank you that you are faithful, that you never leave or forsake, that you don't change, and that you are our rock, and you've given us your word, and you've given us your spirit. So may we hold on to that hope, and even when we feel weak, know that you are holding on to us. And so, Lord, I pray for those in the midst of struggle and hardship. Lord, we pray for Caroline. We pray for her, her healing, her, her restoration. We pray for encouragement of heart and mind. And, Lord, we pray that as you continue to strengthen her and, and restore her, that this will continue to be an opportunity for her to, to give you the praise, for Randy to do so as well. Uh, Lord, we, we thank you for um, just the fact that you always come through. Now, often in the ways we don't expect, but you are always with us and you bring us through. So, Lord, we pray for all those in the midst of devastation that we can't even begin to imagine how it is affecting lives. Lord, we pray. We thank you for those who are safe. We pray for those who are in harm's way that they'll be delivered. We pray that you will send your people your hands and feet to bring hope and restoration and that people will be drawn to you through this. Lord, help us be who you've called us to be and to continue to pray and respond. Lord, we pray for Greg's recovery, that you grant him healing. Lord, we pray for others who've been sick. We pray that you restore them. Lord, we thank you that we can depend upon you in each moment. But Lord, when we are weary, we ask for your spirit to renew us. Lord, for those that we're unaware of, those who are hurting or in need, show us how we can express your love, offer your life. Lord, we thank you for the testimonies. We thank you for the birthdays. We thank you for the reasons to celebrate. And we thank you that even though there might have been things to try to deter us from being here, you worked. You got it done. You brought us here. And so we thank you. We thank you that you led us to this place to, to give praise to your name. And we pray that we'll encourage others to have that blessing as well. Lord, we thank you that you never leave or forsake us. And so we entrust our lives to you and that you will lead us for your purpose. And we pray this all in the name of our Savior, Jesus, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. All right, church, I hope that 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 um, blue book is still close to you. Uh, please stand and we can turn to page 580 which is through it all. He is with us.
through it all. 580, let's stand and sing. Until he calls you home or until he comes for you. Amen. Amen.